Okay, welcome back everybody. I don't honestly know why I'm doing this YouTube channel, but I did, I did know one thing for certain. I knew I would do this video. A reassessment of Jim Aparo. And I want to stress this is a reassessment. Jim Aparo is a pretty well-known artist. When you ask most people about Jim Aparo, they'll mention two works. A Death in the Family and Nightfall. These two works were done very late in his career. It was close to retirement after a th nearly 30 years with, with DC. And I'm going to provide a lot of historical context for why this just was almost the worst part of his career. And to be known for two works produced in that era is, is tragic for me. Because I'm going to go back to this earlier era and, and show you Jim Aparo Prime. The death in the family, it's hard to explain how cynical this was. There was a 900 number you could call to vote on whether Robin lived or died. And I've been on the, the wrong end of corporate decisions where you don't really anticipate how it's going to land, but that's pretty cynical to phone in to kill the boy wonder. And Aparo, I don't think, loved the idea of Robin dying. And so I used to view this as, as though he had been forced to dig his own grave, like he was being forced to draw these stories he didn't believe in. But I've, I've come to have a more charitable view, uh, thanks to the guys over at Cartoonist Kayfabe. <laughs> these, these two stories got reprinted to death and Apparel got royalties off it. So maybe it was almost an act of charity by DC to give this, this venerable old uh, employee a nice retirement gift. So. I've come to view them differently in the big picture, but I do not view them as great wor works or examples of Aparo's skill. But look what was happening. This is Ground Zero, 1986. The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller and Watchmen by Gibbons and Alan Moore really were destroying and deconstructing what Aparo had spent his career on. A lot of these uh, guys had been working for DC forever just got the phone stopped ringing. They were freelancers, and it, it was not great what happened to these old guys because comics were having a new wave of popularity. Batman uh, 1989 would come out a couple years later. So there was this new wave of energy of the new generation coming into comics, and it, apparel was not part of it. So here we have this new fan wave coming in, and for the first time, they're encountering apparel past his prime, in my opinion. So that's, uh, that's my kind of warts and all view of of his career. Brave and the Bold was a bi-monthly book, so he'd do that six issues a year, and then he would alternate with other comics, generally detective comics or Batman, so he, he was really the go-to Batman artist, keeping up that Neil Adams uh, standard. One of the reasons his reputation suffers, I think, is because he, he lives in the shadow of two giant figures that are inarguably better and more influential, Neil Adams and Alex Toth. I'll get to Neil Adams later. I'm going to quickly discuss Toth. Toth was brilliant, an innovator, and his style was sort of very similar to Aparo's. I think they had very similar influences. Um, however, Toth was a crank, hard to get along with, and Aparo was a workhorse. Had a contract with DC for one page a day. One page, penciled, inked, and lettered. Almost utterly unique, except for Toth at DC to do his own inking and lettering. And that was his contract. They had to give him a script and he would wake up every morning with a blank page, go to bed with it inked and lettered. His process might be a little different, but that was his pace. And Toth, you know, he, he jumped around. He was hard to get along with, uh, so, but arguably better. But they have a similar style there. Um, their male stock characters bear some similarities and they have a similar spotting of black. Apparel got a very late start. He was 30 years old before he got into comics. He was a self-taught illustrator, worked in advertising, I believe, and I, I haven't seen evidence of this, but I suspect he was in storyboarding because he was so good at prop illustration, vehicle illustration, camera angles, very cinematic. He started at Charlton Comics doing The Phantom, and I, I have some examples. I don't... I have this book, and you can just... You can just see that his anatomy isn't quite dialed in. And I don't actually like this book. The scans are so crunchy that it, the art looks bad. But there are a few original pieces in there. And you can see he's not quite fully formed. He, he sort of works it out at Charlton. And then by the time he hits the ground at DC, he is prime. Um, but you see a little bit of his 
this this page is more representative of where he would be when he goes to DC. He does the Phantom for Charlton, ends up over at DC, and he starts out working for Adventure Comics, which is a like a non-character specific title. He's doing Aquaman and Spectre stories. So this, this is Jim Aparo Prime. Look at this cover. If I told you that Neil Adams did that, you'd believe it. Um, that is just a badass drawing. Also, he's inking himself a lot of technique in the ink, this kind of stipple for the splash, the, the white out off the black. Look at this very subtle screen he's given that cowl going to black just giving it a little bit of an edge uh beautiful work and i i also uh, i gotta give the colorist props i love that purple orange very unusual for the era this is uh so this is the gym apparel i want to talk about these are books of the era here's that that specter story here's aquaman and then he would go on to do a, a lion's share of his work on a book called the brave and the bold which is a a Batman team-up book, so it would always be Batman and someone else. And I, I, uh, I suspect sometimes it was a book used to keep characters under copyright protection. So uh, lots of silly team-ups in that book. And uh, and Apero has a very buttoned-up naturalistic style. It's sort of like Leslie Nielsen in the the Naked Gun. It's funny because he doesn't know it's funny. But Apero takes his subjects completely seriously, no matter how ridiculous the subject. This is an early story. He won an award for it. It was a horror story in House of Secrets. And you you see his... It's easy to miss what Apero is so good at. The furniture is extremely detailed and specific. He's uh, just good at the mundane things that other artists don't really like drawing. And this is a, a suburban horror story. So you see his vehicle and architecture drawings are just rock solid. Look at this for a minute. Just that frame, and he, he doesn't dwell on it or, or draw attention to it. Beautifully staged. All that black, even on the, the hat and the figure, bringing that into the, the foreground. We have the dash framing that, that running family. So much communicated in very few details. So this is where he really got noticed at DC was the specter. These four covers here are a reprint of the of the Apero series. He's, his, his work is very accessible. He's been re, reprinted a lot. The story, I'm gonna make a little bit of a case for Apero as an innovator. From this issue, for Adventure Comics 439, it's reprinted down here in the lower left. So look at this. I, I mean, it was the 70s. Uh, I, I, want, I want to stress this was not a golden era for comic books. And so that is also uh, the the lion's share of his work, that page per day for, you know, 20 odd years, the 10 years, 10 or 12 years I consider his prime was kind of working on books that were, that have not aged all that well. So the artwork is a bit lost, but not only this, this black uh, frame, which is very innovative for a kind of dark horror story. Uh, they didn't, they only did it one issue. I expect maybe the printing costs went up or something, but where he excels is at these, these boring pages of exposition. So think of this from a script standpoint. Jim Kerrigan's walking down the steps. He encounters this uh, peanut vendor or whatever and has a brief conversation and walks on. In every frame, something is going on. Here is the they see each other, beautifully staged, by the way. Then we spin the camera down around. Corgan's come to the bottom. He's making the order, or flipping the guy a coin, then opening the bag, turns away. Again, the, the framing on each of these is beautiful. Apparel has added all those details of the character doing something in every frame, moving this boring dialogue forward. Also look at this shot down here in the lower right. The camera is sitting on the ground behind this guy's heel. So he's just he's just chosen to, to make that guy's foot the biggest thing in the frame to give Corrigan that nice black L to frame him. Really nice, beautiful stuff. Now look at the, the spotting of blacks. This is a, a night scene, so he's using a lot more blacks. Try drawing someone holding a gun. He's just so good at it. It is It's so natural. He 
just chooses whatever angle works for it. This reverse three quarter slight upshot, directing your eye toward the guy that's been framed with all that nice negative space. Look at the acting in these two guys. You see the kind of toth uh, male lead here. Then this shot, this, I remember this shot decades later. Think about what's happening here. The guy's turning on a spotlight. So the two characters are reacting to the bright light. Corrigan with a gun in his hand. Try to draw that. that is, that's an extremely subtle and complex motion. And it's so natural. You, you just, you ingest it without even seeing how difficult it is to pull off. I don't know that Toth could do a better drawing than that. In the story, Corrigan is a, embodies the spirit of the specter, which is a, the ghost of vengeance. So Corrigan is actually dead, kept alive by the spirit of the specter. Well, something goes on here. Something's going on with the specter. I don't remember the whole backstory, but, but God basically calls Corrigan up to the office. Again, really interesting choice. If you, if you imagine in the 70s, the uh, minefield of representing God in a comic book, this is a pretty interesting solution. Also, I find it very cool that Corrigan's suit is, is totally together and Corrigan does not like tie clips because it's so much more dramatic when his tie flies around. Look, again, talk about complex actions. Look at him climbing the escape grabbing the rung with a gun in the same hand. Here's another example of that just mundane motion. Corrigan eating breakfast when the phone rings. I don't know if the breakfast was in the script. We switched to the, you know, guy smoking a stogie. Now he's on the phone, holding it with one arm, putting on the jacket with the other, and you can tell exactly what's happening at that. Really nice exposition. Well, you gotta cover all that dialogue. Here, Corgan, to his own surprise, gets shot. He thinks he's undead, and it turns out he's been brought back to life. I guess he wasn't informed. He'd have been a little more careful. Love this detail. So after Corgan's meeting with God, he's headed back to Earth. Just look at those arms and that, that tie flying. He's taking the express trade. Beautiful use of blacks, much like Toth. Dutch angles. He, he loves uh, tilting the camera just to make the boring scenes more interesting. So tilts this camera, that black figure with the, the light knocked out, and does that beautiful staging of the specter soaring overhead unnoticed. His just excellent uh, vehicle illustrations. He also, he's doing his own lettering, so he's doing his own sound effect lettering as well. His, his shorthand, and, and this is the days before Google Images and stuff, so he must have had, a, had an incredible morgue file, but maybe also a photographic memory. I don't know where you have reference of a guy's hair blowing looking up at a helicopter, but you can see exactly what's happening. Um, and just a, a beautiful three-depth composition, foreground, mid-ground, background, all just tossed exactly right to communicate everything. Batman. Okay. Before I get to, to Apero's Batman work, I'm going to have to do a brief history on Batman at DC. But first, a plug. I'm not going to badger you into the liking and subscribing and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to make a simple request. Support children's literacy. Think of the kids. Have you ever met a kid? They're not that bright. They need all the help they can get. So buy them a book, or maybe if they're short, buy several books they can stand on them. Whatever you do, buy my books. Come on, come on. Think of the children. Apero was, during the 70s, the premier Batman artist. Uh, Neil Adams established the, the look, but let's go back for a bit. Batman is as old as comic books. I, 1939, Detective Comics, uh, I forget the issue. This is uh, how he was in the 40s and 50s, this very cartoony style. I love this corny stuff, but here's, here's Batwoman with her heels and tasteful clutch, Batmite. So this is the goofiness of the 40s and 50s uh, due to that, you don't see it here, but it's that Comics Code 
approval thing there that caused uh, the superhero comics to be so juvenile. So this is from the very first Batman comic. And I recommend you go to a YouTube channel called Comic Tropes. He does a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of this first Batman story. And Bob Kane essentially cribbed every pose in this. Bob Kane could barely draw. It was sort of a, the worst kept secret in the industry is he, he couldn't draw Batman after the third issue. He uh, hired ghosts. And unlike uh, Simon and, and Schuster, who sold Superman for a couple hundred bucks, and, you know, DC had to be embarrassed into paying their retirement, Bob Kane signed a deal where DC would only buy uh, Batman comics from him and he would just put his name on the work of all these other artists. Here's an example. This is not Bob Kane's drawing, but he, he was certainly paid for this. Um, so you see, uh, we go from that sort of German expressionist, hardcore beginning. Now we're going into the 40s, the more jokey, cartoony. You know, Robin has entered the picture. It's an all-ages deal. Here's an example of those, those golden age stories. Bruce Wayne loses guardianship of Dick Grayson. They're both in the courtroom in their costumes. I, I suspect someone may gather their secret identities. Um, this is uh, the work of a, a man whose name you won't soon forget. Dick Sprang did this beautiful, very cartoony, stylized stuff with all the Batarang X, all the secret Batcave stuff. Very much a decoder ring type of existence. Bill Finger... The writer who did all the heavy, heavy lifting for uh, Bob Kane loved putting Batman and Robin in giant environments so they'd interact with giant phonographs or billiard balls. And then just to, and the beautiful diagrams always, cutaways of the Bat Cave. I don't know how he gets his Bat plane out of there, but that's for another issue. And then my personal pinnacle of golden age goofiness is, and it is a fantasy story, it's not canon, lest you think, this is an old Bruce Wayne and an old Batwoman who have married <laughs> and had Batman and Robin Jr. And so they helpfully wear these Roman numeral twos on their chest. And then here's, a, here's a, one of those great, wow, look at our son fight. <laughs> Go it, young Bruce. Give him a jolly good poke. All right, so I, I do all that to give you a historical context for the goofiness of Batman prior to this. 1964, Batman sales were, were diving. DC Harbaugh negotiated a new contract with Bob Kane saying, We've got to, you've got to let us credit writers and artists. It's happening over at Marvel. Um, and Carmen... Carmine Infantino developed this more updated, quote-unquote, realistic Batman. And now you see, compared to what I just showed you, this is Neil Adams, what he brought to Batman. So Neil Adams is the man he, he brought, even beyond the writers, he, he turned day scenes into night. He really tried to add a seriousness to Batman and take it seriously on his own level. Obviously, we're talking about a guy who dresses like a bat to fight crime, but um, it, it's, uh, it's magic realism. It's where you take the ridiculous premise completely seriously. And uh, this, this became the most popular form of Batman in the early 70s. Look at that, the billow on that cape, how he really takes advantage of that beautiful stuff. Um, so that's Neil Adams, but Neil Adams only worked on Batman for three years. If you like this Neil Adams version of Batman, Jim Aparo is the guy who carried, <laughs> carried that thing on his back for the next 12 years. So these three on the right are Neil Adams. Uh, this was actually a, a frame in a story. Uh, DC liked it so much they would reuse it for covers. Very iconic. This, this one as well. So that's the Neil Adams Batman. This is Jim Aparo. So for my money, just as cool, maybe a little cooler. I loved how apparel over the years began to elongate the neck and the ears to almost a ridiculous degree. But look at the the twist in that that abdomen and that torso, um, and the of course the stylistic ridiculousness of that cape. But just the 
the beauty in those curves. So let's go to the Batman years at DC for Jim Apparel. So this is from The Brave and the Bold, the team-up book. This is uh, Mr. Miracle. And again, the joy in Apparel is how seriously he takes it, you know. So it's almost like Jack Webb talking on the phone in a bat costume, if you pick up that reference. And again, the the... The artistry in apparel is in the details. Look at the folds in, in this cape, implying the, the large shoulder muscles and where it would fold down there and then being grabbed by the wind. A down perspective, so look at these feet are pretty much planted on that, on that floor plane. It's just the, pulling that beautiful curve out of this ridiculous collar. And then Batman, that the neck muscles connected to the bottom of the cranium there. His, of course, muscular traps. And then those folds. Look at how much is communicated in those folds. The big surface areas of those muscles. And then the gravity pulling it down. That's just so much communicated in so few lines. The, the billow as he turns to leave the room. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oversample this issue because this is one of my favorite comics of all time. One of the reasons this period of apparel is not uh, widely regarded is because, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but Bob Haney's stories are so goofy. So this story, imagine the effect this had on a young uh, aspiring artist. In this story, Batman is, Dealing with terrorists, so they got Sergeant Rock in here. He's just a piece of furniture. Batman is working against these terrorists who have gone to Jim Aparo's house, swapped out the script so that Batman will die in the script and then he will stop chasing them. The level of reality is difficult to grasp in that situation. Oh, I also want to briefly, this is why I had that picture of a Bern Hogarth. Apero would frequently do this kind of double line on the on his signature. Uh, Alex Toth did that a while. I've seen other artists do it. I believe it's a nod to Bern Hogarth, who did illustrated the the Tarzan strip in newspapers, which is hugely influential on this this era of comic artists. Apero lists uh, Milt Caniff. Milt Kniff, I guess you say, and uh, Alex Raymond. He doesn't mention uh, Hogarth, but I believe this is a, a nod to Hogarth. Excellent vehicle design and just spinning the camera around. He is expert at gra pulling design elements out of the situation. Uh, th I just find this drawing so beautiful. The light source quickly established, right? Upper left here, boom, light source. So he, he uses that to make that nice triangle. He takes he implies the, the muscular chest, but everything else falls to black except that belt, which is probably metallic. Then these, just these beautiful points to make that crescent shape on the ground. The sawtooth there to imply the shadow going down. And that is such a natural walking pose with the, the knee up, the light hitting it, everything else going to black. There, there's a lot of drawing knowledge in that scene. And let's just make it a down shot to make it slightly more complex, but to show the environment. This is Jim Apero at his drawing table. And is, to say I didn't pour over every detail, every meager detail he reveals of his existence here. He is a smoker, I guess. One thing that immediately jumped out to me, he lives in Connecticut and he apparently has access to a boat with an outboard motor because his friend lives in a lighthouse. So he lives near the water in Connecticut. So I'm thinking maybe I can make a living as an artist. It's a false premise, but uh, I'll put that up with Bob Haney's other crazy ideas. Okay, so here's the terrorists. And Jim Aparo doesn't understand what has gotten into Bob, why he's killing off Batman <laughs> and Sergeant Rock midway through the story. And then suddenly the terrorists appear. There's a Quick stalling maneuver, breaks his pencil, and notice there's no eraser on it. It's one of those uh, like barrel pencils with the metal tip. He sneaks out looking for a sharpener, and he's going to read up in his 
hidden in this lighthouse. He's going to quickly redraw this story and send it to New York <laughs> so these terrorists can't kill him. I, don't, I, I want to see that moment when the story's printed and the terrorists vanish. Um, this is a, a cool page because it uh, presumably it shows his penciling technique. This is Bob Haney, the writer. I guess his house isn't so too shabby either. Another example of the beautiful subtleness in his storytelling. So we have a like a one, two, one, two. So we're we're moving forward in time across these these four panels. Actually, it looks like he, he actually redrew this scene twice instead of Xeroxing it. The one, two. The guy's there, he's gone. So we're seeing his motion. Beautifully framed, by the way. Batman watches, steps out. Again, you can see exactly what that guy's up to. How clear is that? So, and then dropping out the background, using a down shot, because now we're going to focus on these figures. Some action is happening quickly. Batman is moving forward, the cape's billowing out. Then he er, stops. The cape sweeps forward. Guy spins. Beautiful, beautiful, clear storytelling. I'm back with Jim Aparo. They know they've been had. He's on the run. All right, this is, we're going to Bob Haney, the writer now. Look at this shot, that Dutch angle, the detail of the pine needles in the foreground and all in black, just, just black. There is no line in this. It's just spotted blacks. The long shadows, so it's moonlit. Long shadows to establish that ground plane. Then look at, oh boy, I'm going way in here. Look at the subtlety of that inking. Just that one white gap shows you not only the back of the dog, but what direction the dog is running. Head, back, butt. We, all the information is, it, are in those black shapes. Again here, he could, have, he could have notched that in, but he gave just a highlight to show the moonlight hitting that calf as it's raised. The shoulders and again he knows how to put a, a gun in somebody's hand <laughs> this something's fishy about this. this is obviously from photo reference and i wonder if maybe it was even drawn by someone else that is uh maybe the editor trying to get on top of all these story changes ridiculously jim apero is drawing it and it's happening uh, the meta and there are these crazily violent moments Sergeant Rock, presumably a member of the U.S. military and a good guy, is showing this guy's face into a cage with a rabid rat. It may be a bluff, but um, it's a little bit dark. Again, the just that, <laughs> that straight-faced ridiculousness of Batman driving a police car, but a completely real police car. So Jim's trying to bang out those pages. Oh, the terrorists are on his tail. The nice effects lettering but look how it's behind the phone so the, that sort of the hand about to touch the phone really nice building of tension this is some terrific uh action he magically you know dodges the bullets that's what they back in the old days uh, where they hadn't quite ironed out the mythology in a re, particularly realistic way batman used to run around in this bodysuit and he could just dodge bullets because he kind of was just fast that way but this tackle and then that, those concentric circles showing the, the pow of it. And look at this, on his knees, uppercut, that, that beautifully wrinkled cape kind of just, just coming up off the ground with that, the gun flying out, really nice. His, his beatings are particularly visceral, I find. Tony Toth could sell a scene better than that. Beautiful, these long shadows giving that ground plane really nicely staged cinematic scene. Also, his, his camera choices, he does these uh, actions. He falls, he hits the track, he rolls off. Whew, just and it, ridiculously, he was somehow awakened by the pin poking his chest. And then very similarly, Batman jumps on the car. You see his cape flying and then somebody inside the car shooting up, he rolls away. Really, everything communicated really clearly. Look how he's choosing his blacks on that scene. Gorgeous. Dutch angle, super close up, nicely staged for Batman looking at a clue. 
unlike, say, Jack Kirby, who was doing his most bombastic work in the 70s, Apero is very conservative and very real, very dialed down. And it's it's almost like you're watching a TV show or something. Uh, I consider him a progenitor of, of more like the Gary Frank and Brian Hitch school of realist cinema illustration. You know, kind of a Checkpoint Charlie situation here. Very real. Nighttime. Across the border. Has to take off his ring. Look at that close-up of those hands. Beautiful. And then he's got to take a beat down. <laughs> and look, look at how brutal and real that is. The back muscles. Look at that arm. That is... Uh, makes your teeth rattle. Man, look at that. Bam, bam, bam. So I suspect... Justice will prevail. Uh, just a, a couple examples of these boring, boring exposition pages and how he just, he changes it up. So much going on here. Again, the minimal. Look at how much he's communicating with those blacks. Leaving a little bit of a gap for those figures to read. <laughs> Ship couldn't be any smaller. All the, all the details are there. This too, look how he takes advantage of this these little negative spaces to put some garbage cans, so you know, you're in an alley. Blah, 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 blah. So he's, but constantly giving the characters something to do. The, he gives the guy a pipe so he can point the pipe. This is, kind of, this is, again, pretty dark. It's a little bit in the gutter, but look at the beautiful blacks and the, and the cigarette to make the character a bit more villainous. These blacks, the guy's got that grappling hook, the poor guy drowning, and then he kills him. And, and look at how... Now, this is under the comics code seal of approval, so they can only get away with so much violence. So look how in his inking, he implies the horror, but maybe those guys aren't going to look so close at that drawing. Really nice. Again, his vehicle stuff is top notch. Really quick set of action, Batman dodging bullets. Look at this. Whew. Really nice. way he tosses the camera around to tell his story. We've got the fighter jets, we have a helicopter. There's just, <laughs> you can really condense it. And then, I think this is my last image here. Beautiful, maybe fanciful from a martial arts perspective, but beautiful, natural characters also with really strong lines of action. nice anyway so the next time you talk to somebody about Jim Apparel I'm sure it comes up frequently and they mention death in the family or nightfall I hope it causes you that same shooting pain it causes me and if I've done that then my my work here is done I'll see you again in two weeks